So, so we finished uh, half of the chapter, which was seven pages, and now we're going to continue with the rest of uh, this chapter called, what was it called now? Um, resources, African resources, I think it's called. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so, where we, uh, our marketing economy, the Times, 24th July 1964. It's like just before, uh, one year before the work, this book was published. Anyway, let's continue. So Kwame Nkrumah says here in, on page eight, this train of thought links up directly with that of the chairman of Booker Brothers, Sir Jack Campbell, whose combine of companies is busy monopolizing sugar and byproduct industries in British Guyana. Which, what was British Guyana? Um, we can talk about it later. Shipping and trading in the Caribbean and East Africa. And it's now penetrating into the west of the African continent. What is the west of African continent? Uh, west Africa region, right? Like where Mali and, and, and countries are. Um, Sir Jack Campbell asserted at the annual address of the African Bureau. Bureau let me just mute. Um, Sir Jack Campbell asserted at the annual address of the African Bureau in London on 29th November 1962 that agriculture was the basis of African development and that plantations were an effective method of increasing economic potential. It's funny if we actually uh, compare this to let's say uh, the times of slavery in America, that's what uh, the southern states were, uh, you know, uh, talking about. Oh yeah, let's keep the slaves because it's so important that agriculture, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm talking about. If any of you know about uh, uh, southern, uh, southern states history in America back in the 1800s. Anyway, he considered that so long as industrialized agriculture employed men free to come and go, it was preferable in terms of both efficiency and liberty to the communized collective farming whose results had fallen short of expectation both in Russia and China. Interesting perspective, by the way, compared to like what uh, material conditions that uh, the, the, the world was in back in the days. This is the, from the Times, 30th of November, 1962. He does not seem to have convinced the sugar workers of British Guyana, and it is a moot point whether he has been able to impress the benefits of his free to come and go. You know, this uh, basic capitalist principle like the invisible hand, it's just gonna solve itself. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, free to come and go plantation philosophy on the workers for his companies in Nyasaland. Rhodesia, which today is Zimbabwe, where that, by the way, when we to put it in perspective, today Zimbabwe has freed itself from the, uh, you know, from the Western colonizers. Um, uh, Rhodesia and South Africa, which was at that time apartheid, right? Even the scientific supporters of the imperialist pattern are aware of the flaws in their injunctions, but they cunningly attribute the emphasis placed by the developing states upon industrialization to political uh, ambitions rather than to economic and social necessity. A European representative of the University of Malaya, Mr. D. W. Fryer, speaking at the meeting of the International Geographic Conference, to which reference is made above said that an increase in the efficiency of traditional export uh, industries in the underdeveloped countries was an obvious move, but it was politically unattractive. It suggested continued acceptance of the old colonial economy. Industrialism was an integral part of nationalist movement. Its mainspring was not economic, but political and political expediency was often more important than economic efficiency in the location of new industry. This is, you know, the axis of this neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism, basically 
um, you know, fusing political and economic and social economic and so on uh, things into like, uh, you know, their own their own way interests, basically. We can see it with IMF that we were discussing about before. The more efficient management of primary production and improvement on a marketing level is imperialism's gain and our loss. The point has been made quite clearly by no less a person than the chairman of Bolsa, the Bank of London and South America, Sir, Sir George Bolson. The letter was reported in the Financial Times of uh, 6th March 1964 as being confident of a raise in commodity prices, which would have considerable effect on the foreign exchange exchanges for whose benefit question mark sir george provides the answer it should help the reserve currencies sterling and the dollar he said why because being tied to these currencies the primary producers will be accumulating their surpluses in sterling and dollar balances quote end this appears to be nothing short of a direct confession of the major interest of the banking and financial world in the exploitation of the developing countries. Developing countries, you know, people say usually say when it's developing countries, it's the third world countries, by the way. I'm, I'm just talking now, um, which is ridiculous because third world is a concept of non-aligned movement back in, you know, uh, the Cold War era. But yeah, developing countries is a better way to describe it anyway. It is interesting, therefore, to know that Bolsa's transfer agents in London are Patino Mines and Enterprises Consolidated, the American Controlled Combined Operating Mines in Latin America and Canada, and intimately associated with the groups engaged in exploiting Africa's natural resources. We are certainly not against marketing and trading. As some have mentioned before, like, oh, what are we going to do when we have like this kind of anti-imperialist uh, slash socialist perspective uh, about marketing, trading and trading with the outside world? Well, here Kwame ex explains, on the contrary, we are for a widening of our potentialities in these spheres. And we are convinced that we shall be able to adjust the balance in our favor, right? Not in the favor of the outside uh you know uh uh you know encroachment of our economy and so on in our favor only by developing uh an agriculture attuned to our needs and supporting it with a rapidly increasing industrialization that will break the neo-colonialist pattern which at present operates uh if you know about sankara i've posted a video about his speech about where, where he mentioned you know um basically the dependency on food from outside instead of the being dependent on food production within uh, its own country anyway a continent like africa <clears throat> however much it, it it increases its agricultural output will not benefit unless it is sufficiently politically and economically united to force the developed world to pay it a fair price for its cash crops a fair price Let's let's it, that's the key word, right? A fair price, not uh, you know where it's a, again the um, unequal balance of economy where we have to pay more and they pay less. Basically, that's an inequality in itself. Uh, that, that's why we have this book to explain, not because we are idealistic or something. It's not even that they have to pay more. At least pay us enough, you know, like a, on an equal term. But anyway, to give one illustration, both Ghana and Nigeria have in the post-war independent spirit enormously developed their production of cocoa, which again Sankara actually also talked about, as the table on page 10 shows. Page 10 is the next page, by the way. This result has not been obtained by chance. It is the consequence of heavy in internal expenditure on control of disease and pests and the subsidizing of insecticides and spraying machines provided to farmers and the importing of new varieties of cocoa 
uh, seedlings which are resistant to the endemic ills which previous cocoa trees had developed. By means such as these, Africa as a whole greatly increased her cocoa production, while that of Latin America remained stationary. What advantage has Nigeria and Ghana gained through this uh, stupendous increase in agricultural productivity, you ask? In 1954 uh, 55, when Ghana's production was uh, 210,000 uh, tons, I actually don't know how to convert that to whatever I can convert to in my head, but her 1954 earnings from the cocoa crop were 85 pounds, I assume, million, 85 million pounds. This year, 1964, with an estimated crop of 590 tons, the estimated external earnings will be around 75, 77 million. So it actually uh, is declining, uh, basically. Nigeria has suffered a similar experience. In 1954 to 1955, she produced 89,000 tons of beans and received for her crop 39 million pounds. In 1965, it is estimated that Nigeria will produce 310,000 tons and is likely to receive for it around 40 million pounds in other words ghana and nigeria have trebled their production of this particular agriculture product but their gross earnings from it have fallen from gross as in you know gross or whatever you call it as in you know the 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 formal way of 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 showing how much you theoretically earn right uh, have fallen from 125 million 217 million basically the economy has shrinked i mean in economic perspective of the world there's you know uh what we call it like inflation again right and stuff like that and with the inflation it's even falling it's ridiculous a detailed study of production and price oh by the way let's let's look at the chart here for the ones who are gonna follow uh when we upload the video um here you'll see the chart. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but yeah, yeah, you can see the chart here. Um, I'm not gonna go into de to detail as we have very, very little time to finish our chapter here. Um, but I mean, he just uh, uses it as evidence, you know, uh, because people love to look at numbers when you come with claims, right? A detailed study of production and price shows that it is the developed consuming country which obtains the advantage of the increased production in the less developed one. So long as African ag agricultural producers are disunited, they will be unable to control the market price of their primary products. So that meaning they are not actually deciding for themselves how much, uh, you know, uh, the export should be rather it's the other way around again very sad uh, problem that is still here today in Africa and a lot of um, third world uh, slash developing world countries. As experience with the Cocoa Producers Alliance has shown, any organization which is based on a mere commercial agreement between primary producers is insufficient to secure a fair world price. This can only be obtained when the united power of the producer countries is harnessed by common political and economical policies and has behind it the united financial resources of the states concerned. This is key because, uh, as I was telling some of our comrades here, that um, there is like this uh, predatory way that, uh, you know, the mining companies, for example, that I was telling before, Ivory Coast and... Uh, Oh, and what was it, the other Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone? Basically, they bid the countries against themselves, right? So the one that is uh, giving the most favorable deals to these uh, outside uh, corporations are the ones who are gonna win. But in reality, they also have to 
not earn anything from that uh you know mining company that they will operate in that country so basically there's no unified principle of okay let's do it only this way so that you don't uh play us against each other right basic uh you know uh you know this basic uh, problem that Kwame Nkrumah points to so long as Africa remains divided it will therefore be the wealthy consumer countries who will dictate the price of the African cash crops nevertheless even if Africa could dictate the price of its cash crops this would not by itself provide the balanced economy which is necessary for development the mass the answer must be industrialization again uh, what Kwame Nkrumah here is basically saying is that we should not be idealistic and expect okay just because we not blah 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 that we're just gonna solve the problems this is gonna take much more than just uh you know basic uh you know strategy this is gonna take a lot more than just uh you know even unity or whatever um but i i think you 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 get my point the african continent however cannot hope to industrialize effectively in the half of Zard, Lacey's fair manner of Europe. What is Lacey's fair? Is basically, oh yeah, let's do, just do what we want with the economy, right? Uh, let's ignore all the socio-economic problems and so on. In the first place, there's the time factor. In the second, the socialized modes of production and tremendous human and capital investment involved called call for cohesive and integrated planning. Africa will need to bring to its aid all its latent inequity and talent in order to meet the challenge that independence and the demands of its people for better living have raised. The challenge cannot be met on any piecemeal scale, but only by the total mobilization and consonance resources within the framework of comprehensive socialist planning and deployment. We have noted that in the countries of the highest uh, settler population and therefore the most exploded so far in Africa, Algeria, Congo, Kenya, Morocco, Rhodesia, Malawi, South Africa, Tanganyika. Tanganyika, I think was uh, Tanzania, but I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's funny because this is basically what we were talking about me and my Namibian comrade here about, you know, root, uh, like South Africa, within the South Africa thing, this is just examples, right? Namibia is also part of that sphere of influence. Agriculture is predominant. In the case of South Africa, the most highly developed area of African continent, the contribution of agriculture and mining is together equal to that of industry, manufacture and construction. South Africa's economy is heavily bolstered by the export of its mining output. Gold contributes up to 70% of the total exports, which makes the economy for all its apparent boom and the heavy increasing foreign investment basically almost and as insecure as that of the less developed countries of the continent. For all its pushing secondary industries, its chemicals manufacture, uh, military production, steel processing, and the rest, South Africa has so far failed to lay down the basis of solid industrialization. G. E. Menel, chairman of Anglo Transvaal Consolidation Investment Company, which controls gold, diamonds, and uranium, made a most telling statement in his annual address on 6th December 1963 to the Johannesburg shareholders meeting. Quote, the nation's economy is based to a significant degree on wasting assets. The gold mines of the Transvaal and Orange Free State, South Africa, by the way, this is South Africa. We have become more and more aware of this in recent years as small mines near the end of their lives without any sign of new large gold fields in spite of the many millions being spent on exploration uh, quote and investment in south africa's economy comes mainly from western capital with with which local finance um not hard hardy enough to stand on its own feet is strongly bound 
Quick profits are the incentives so that while Anglo Transvaal chairman sees the dangers to the economy, he was nonetheless just happy to be able to announce that record profits were again achieved in 1963. Again, we can see like uh, the clash between short term economic planning and then long term economic planning, which would sustain itself into the future, right? The whole of the economy is geared to the interest of the foreign capital that dominates it. South Africa's banking institutions, like those of most African states, are offshoots of the Western banking and financial houses. South Africa is dominated by Western monopoly even more than by any other sector of the continent. Because the investments are many times greater and the dependence upon gold and other mining as the center of the economy gears it inextricably to that monopoly. Monopoly, what is that? That's basically the um, the industrialized core, meaning Europe, America, and so on. Its vulnerability is intensified by the fact that it is a supplier of crude and semi-finished products to the factories of the West on a larger scale than the rest of Africa and an earner of greater profits for their financial backers. Nigeria tells um, in a few basic figures a tale of a different kind of economic maladjustment. In 1960, agriculture, forestry and fishing accounted for 63% of the economic activity, mining 1%. The imbalance is emphasized by the extremely low ratio of 2% for industry and manufacture, eliminating at once any comparison with the 1% contribution of mining and 4% of agriculture to America's total economic product. Wow, interesting. What does America even have to do with Nigeria? Some people might ask, right? In the case of the United States, this low proportion supports a vast super structure of industry and manufacture. In Nigeria, it connotes, connotes simply a total disregard under colonialism of Nigeria's potentialities, right? Like the potential, yeah, I, I think all of you get it. The reason for this lies not in the fact that Nigeria is devoid of natural industrial resources, right? Like people who are educated or, you know, whatever uh, material means, you know, material conditions that lets it industrialize naturally, right? as recent findings of oil and iron confirmed funny because today uh nigeria is very heavily dependent on oil again uh wow Kwame Nkrumah had such a great insight it was that nigeria's agriculture provided greater pro profitability for european investment than the risks that were involved in the la larger capital provisions called for by mining exploration and exploitation in 1962, petroleum and petroleum products contributed 9.9% for Nigeria's exports, but it is Shell British Petroleum. I, uh, this is also key because today they are also monopolizing on the oil industry around the world. Uh, if you any of you know, BP is British Petroleum. Anyway, that hopes to reap most of the benefits. The bulk of these exports was in crude oil, exceeding 3 million tons. The oil company is aiming at an export target of 5 million tons of crude oil by 1965. The processing plants are in Europe, not in Nigeria. Haha, -ha, interesting, huh? So basically, um, Nigeria exports its crude oil, which is like, you know, the basically coming out of earth and it's processed in Europe, basically Europe owning this oil that is produced from where it comes from. Interesting perspective when you think about it. The oil refinery going up in Port Har 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 Harcourt is owned by Shell British Petro Petroleum. The natural gas piping is owned by Shell Barclays DC and O. The oil refinery is meant to handle only 10% of Nigeria crude oil output and its products will serve only Nigeria's domestic market. Such an arrangement makes it possible not to disturb operations outside Nigeria 
while making super profits on Nigerian operations. Generally speaking, um, in spite of the exploration costs, which are written off for tax purposes, anyway, uh, and many times covered by eventual profits, uh, mining has proved a very profitable venture for foreign capital investment in Africa. Its benefits for the for the Africans, on the other hand, uh, despite all the for the talk to the contrary, have been negligible. This is explained by the absence of industry and manufacture based upon the use of domestic natural resources and of the trade that is their concomitant. For mining production is destined uh, principally for exporting in its primary form. Ex primary form as you know, crude oil, not non-refined, is exported, and then uh, like the ones who are reaping the benefits are the foreign companies based in Europe, for example, where they refine them and sell them at extremely higher price. You you get my point here. Uh, certain exceptions. We are about to end uh, this chapter, by the way. So this generalization are to be found in South Africa, Zambia, and the Congo. Congo is also key. Congo is in the middle of Africa and has huge amounts of, even today, resources for, for example, battery productions and so on. You know, since we're talking about green energy today, you know. Anyway, uh, some small conversions has been taking place also in countries like Morocco, Algeria, Mozambique. South Africa's copper is exported in the form of metal and a small part of its iron is sent overseas as ingots. Ingots is like, you know, again, the crude form. Its gold is refined. But for these exceptions, most exported minerals are shipped from Africa in their primary state, right? They don't have industry to refine them and make them quote unquote shiny and, you know, applicable for use uh, when you basically buy them up or something like that let's see here where were we um south africa's copper but for those these exceptions most exported minerals are shipped from africa in their primary state they go to feed the industries and plants of europe america and japan the ore that is to be produced by in swaziland is swatini whatever we want to call it interesting also by the swaziland iron ore development company Owned jointly, of course, by Anglo-American Corporation and the powerful British steel group Guest Keen and Nettle Falls. Strange names these people have. Will go at the rate of 1.2 million tons annually for 10 years from 1964 to a Japanese steel combine. Some people might ask, what does a Japanese company has to do with this? Well, the, as I was telling you before, like uh, Japan is part of the, you know, the network of these different companies. That's why it's so hard to put the finger at one, uh, you know, culprit, you know, in this imperialistic system. Today is even more advanced, right, with the NGOs and so on, where it's very hard to point finger at who's who and where does the source come from. But if you, as they say, the uh, the check out the you know the stream of money you know it comes to the source you'll find out that it's basically a corporation or a third party entity rather than um you know whatever american state or whatever even though they're all working together it's kind of obvious to us who are reading this book but not obvious to somebody who has not researched this problem when the countries of their origin are obliged to buy back their minerals and other raw products in the form of finished goods, they do so at grossly inflated prices. What was I talking about before, right? A general electric advertisement carried in the March April 1962 issue of Modern Government informs us that from the heart of Africa to the hearts, uh, hearts of the world's steel mills comes or for stronger steel, better steel, steel for buildings, machinery, and more steel rails. Uh, quote, and with, their, with the steel from Africa, General Electric supplies transportation uh, for bringing out another 
valuable mineral for its own use and that of other great imperialist exploiters. In lush verbiage, the same advertisement describes how, quote, uh, deep in the tropical jungle of Central Africa lies one of the world's richest deposits of manganese ore, uh, quote, end. But is it for Africa's needs? Uh, Kwame asks, not at all. The site, which is, quote, being developed by the French concern, Compagnie Minière de Lugu, or whatever, is located in the upper reach of the Ugu River in the Gabon Republic. What in the world? All this is so crazy, right? After the ore is mined, it will first be carried 50 miles by cableway, then it will be transferred to ore cars and hauled 300 miles by diesel electric, uh, electric, <laughs> comrade, you're funny, electric locomotives to the port of Point Noir for shipment to the world's steel mills. Quote and I guess, for the world the read the united states first and france second that exploitation of this nature can take place is due to the balkanization of the african continent imagine he's talking about balkanization when the the balkans were more united back in 1965 right anyway interesting perspective balkanization is the major instrument of neocolonialism and will be found wherever neocolonialism is practiced oh that was actually pretty hard to be honest but um yeah um let's end this uh what do you call it this chapter for today i'm very glad that we actually managed to finish a chapter where you uh, comrades could keep um what do you call it? Like your concentration. I'm so keep happy. Keep on the focus. Yeah, keep your focus exactly. Um, I think we will resume the next chapter. Um, whenever you want, we can democratically uh talk about it right now in this session. Um, uh, first of all, yes, let, let's, yes. let's 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 plan when when we uh, when we go to the next chapter. And by the way, for the viewers out there, next time next chapter is gonna be obstacles to economic progress wow this is gonna be interesting huh we are not even done with Indeed. even the quarter of the book but obstacle to economic progress it's gonna be very interesting to look i i already have an idea of what the next chapter is gonna be about but it's gonna be interesting also to have your inputs comrades brothers and sisters on what the next chapter is gonna be and how we're gonna manage to interpret it right because we are humans. We have different ways of looking at the world from different perspectives. But yes, yes. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to look at the next chapter. Yeah. So uh, before we end this, uh, you know, reading group session, let's maybe have a quick summary of what the book was about, right? Of course. Uh, or the chapter was about. Of course. Uh, 